Hello everyone. Thank you for joining another Play UK Salon, a series of talks with creatives and game dev professionals from across the UK. Our guest speaker tonight is Ellie Rainsbury, a composer, sound artist and audio designer. They specialize in music and sound for games, animated, interactive and interdisciplinary works. In this talk, they will explore how physical surroundings, atmosphere, personal mindsets and well-being can inspire and drive the creation of music and sounds. So, Ellie, welcome to the Salon. We're very excited to have you here. So, um, shall we start? Because we are super eager to learn more about what has shaped your creative work. Um, thank you all so much for um, tuning into this talk. Um, I'll be making a transcription of this as well as my slides available afterwards on my website and on my Twitter at Ellie Rainsbury. Um, today I have a list of um, musical folks to check out in the corner there. Um, you may see on the first slide there. Um, I heavily recommend giving them a listen alongside um, hearing me speak. Um, links to the streams will be posted in the chat and can hopefully be set up easily whilst I introduce this and I hope this helps you all inform my talk. Um, I firstly wanted to thank Settled Emerson for not only being a constant stream of support but also inspiring me to write this talk in the way that I intended to and also giving me general invaluable writing advice. I also want to thank the folks that I've lived with, lived with in these places from late 2016 up until now as well as the folks that I've worked with over this time. And I wanted to acknowledge the sources that I've used for this talk, including um, Lewis Gordon and Hannah Licklin's writing for um, their article and zine, respectively. Um, you can check out more about both of those as well as other things I wanted to share at the end. And thank you both for the inspiration. This might be a different post to what you're used to, maybe. Um, at some point, I would like to go into more technical things, but I won't be doing this too much today. My memory has never been too great, even in the short term. And sometimes I've struggled with the executive function to keep on with things at all. Um, this has come from a combination of things, my physical surroundings at the time, um, the atmosphere around them, both politically and socially, and my personal mindsets and well-being and how it fluctuated over time. As an autistic person, this could naturally waver depending on the changes occurring over that time. And there were a lot of them all seemingly happening as I was getting more confident and luckily more connected within my working games. Um, as you can see here, um, I grew up in Stratford upon Avon and in 2011, I started my undergraduate degree in Guildford. I also lived in London for a year as part of my degree's work placement. I spent the earlier part of 2016 living back in my hometown, working between smaller games and media and a part time job. That was until I got my offer to start my postgraduate degree in London, which at this point is where we'll begin. SE4. The hounds, the howls of cats and foxes in the distance, or the cargo train rumbling behind the building, or sirens, the domestic disturbances across the road, the patterned mural trailing the street wall. Avignon Road was between stations, at least three of them. One of them was right by a bakery, which I walked past each day. I'll sometimes be welcomed back into the area after a day at uni to the fresh smell of baked bread. Another was right next to a garden shop with two kittens on guard. The railway line towards that station backed behind my flat's garden, where a train, mostly cargo, would run occasionally. I remember walking more around this area of London. There was also a bus ride away from Peckham, which I feel bad for not exploring more when I did. Um, walking 20 minutes from the flat, however, would eventually lead me to Peckham Rye Park, where it was good to be able to access some green spaces nearby. 
the flat itself as well as my room probably had the most space I had whilst sharing with others in London. A split level flat. I lived with some long time friends where we were able to spend more time with each other. Small gatherings with friends from time to time. The warmth for the heated floors and company that it kept. Significant friendships and relationships developed in this time. And it felt like the start of growth. In the 1980s, there was a movement of um, Japanese ambient music that sought to bring more naturalistic sounds to people living in cities and urban areas using electronic instruments. Hiroshi Yoshimura was one of those composers who had recognised a lot of his work as environmental music. Growing my practice in London, I felt that some of my work related to how he identified with his, and this was a gradual realisation at first when I started working on the game No Longer Home. No Longer Home's theme of graduating and moving away from home resonated closely as I had recently did the latter myself. And adjustments to those sorts of changes were almost always come by with a degree of difficulty. Adjusting to change for an autistic lens can be subjective, depending on the severity of it. And whilst for me, it was not felt immediately since I seeked out independence as much as I could. Um, I felt like a lot of how I felt slowly crept into what I created. Sel and Hannah at Humble Grove, Derek Daly, a session musician who contributed additional music, and I gathered together in my bedroom to develop a live soundtrack for No Longer Home's demo. It was part of the video game and theatre event Beta Public at Camden's People's Theatre. We had a small handful of sessions together before we performed some initial concerts whilst having an audience member play through the game in real time. Not only limited to music, we also had a handful of plates, sand and other items to create life foley. It was the first time that I've performed with an ensemble in years, which was one part of why it was memorable to me. It felt like a more intimate way um, to work with the developers and talk about the direction of No Longer Home soundscape which as a result of this experience was really special. I've still kept the older Logic Pro projects from the performance and a handful of the synth presets I created still act as part of the backbone for most of the soundtrack, overall informing the game's initial audio and music direction. It was also interesting to see how I was able to provide the sort of physical space as well as mental space and drive at the time to have these sorts of rehearsals in the bedroom I was based in on Avignon whilst I was just starting my master's studies. What also felt unique to me here was that with the five of us all together in that shared space, both in my room and on stage, it was a warm feeling to feel recognised amongst my closest contemporaries, not only in terms of creating at a similar age, but in terms of shared experiences, especially with studying in parts of South East London and seeking stability. A couple of us would spend time between parks in Peckham and Greenwich discussing the struggles of living in London and sometimes musing over moving elsewhere to go on more naturalistic walks. Shared time sitting in those parks were a clean break for me moving between contrasting city and university settings, especially when I had to gradually move between environments more often as I moved closer to the end of my master's. The university I went to had space to sit outside and observe the vines change colour across seasons. A rest between how bumbling and overwhelming the transitions between lectures can be and learning new softwares and new systems to work with. I was grateful to have the resources and space I was given and the chances to use this, the space to go further out of my comfort zone, a chance to challenge myself a little more. But with those challenges naturally come along struggles I remember having to receive support from one of my lecturers. We're trying to communicate the need for certain spaces to build my installation work in or with access towards the heavily booked studio spaces. I've worked hard sometimes with trying to seek independence from certain types of help, since from experience I felt undermined with getting help because of the accommodations I needed. Though disclosing my needs this time around alleviated some stress, I still felt like I needed to find other means of coping to get through the remainder of my course. Most of the games I'm known for, I started working on during my masters. Though I was studying full time, 
I was also freelancing part time. And in order to cope with the workload, I would hyper focus and found that both my freelance and uni work flow together. The state kind of became an autopilot for me. Being in this autopilot state had some small benefits whilst balancing work and studies since I would I've always have difficulty with my executive function. I would allow myself to get into the stream of work because some of the time I was working to template with some of my work. This would not only come more naturally when you have melodic variants working together well or using similar instrumentation, but also outside of a creative context, I've had further limitations to the time I had to do everything. This has left me leaving fragments out of memory with what I got from point A to B with a piece and being like, how did I manage to work out a piece of music like this? I have at times come out of the other side of completing a piece with a working memory of how I've say mixed what I've done and how happy I was with that. But I also come out questioning more on how I approached something creatively. I joked from time to time about how the reason that the soundtrack for Wilmot's Warehouse has a more meticulous feel to the point that it has been motivating for others to clean their rooms or work on their own projects um, was because I was living in the headspace of doing my postgraduate thesis at the time. I composed the bulk of the soundtrack over the time I was making preparations to work on the thesis, going into completing it and eventually um, graduating from my course. I think part of this was a coincidence, but a lot I was going through, a lot of what I was going through, what I was studying and the stresses behind it seemed to have crept into it in some way or whatever. Similar to how artists such as um, Yoshimura were composing music for specific and more tangible locations and spaces, I found myself emulating almost the exact surroundings of my academic and working environment and how I was processing everything in between. Whilst my environment affected my creative process this way, the soundtrack was also affected by certain technical limitations that ultimately benefited the music. The music had a lot of variants built up on Wilmot's recurring theme that would dynamically shift depending on the status in your game. The catch was this, because I was working within a single audio script, I had to keep the music tonally and rhythmically the same so that it could dynamically flow between one another seamlessly. I also wanted to be sure the sound design could work together tonally. I think back to how I was similarly limited by some of the work I had to do when completing my master's. I had to create, uh, I had to creatively design sounds for a short clip, um, purely restricted towards what was featured. Tap dripping, rim ambience, a passing train. Between those experiences, those sorts of limitations can still let me play in a smaller confined space and this way explore as far as I could with it. E1. The winding stairwell with bare vines on the walls, creeping along its clean lines and elegant proportions, replacing the green ivy that would crawl along the last flat. Concrete steps echoes you ascend up to the upper row flats, the neighbours croaking cats remain at the foot of it. The rumblings of the train back in Avignon Road was replaced with an air ambulance rising or returning to or from the nearby Royal London Hospital. The low windings of their wings rumbling in the sky. During certain times of the day, the local mosque's calls to prayer can be heard from afar. Trev's house was an understated modernist block with a strong history as well as a stronger community where I would have really liked to have gotten to know more, especially since I didn't get much opportunity to connect with my neighbours before moving. Along with the nearby block, Lister House, it was in risk of demolition by the local council and the residents came together in one of their flats, I think fairly close to ours, to beat and to campaign. A year onwards since I moved out, I've since found out that they won their fight to stop its collapse. It was walking distance from Victoria Park, the Barbican Conservatory and a local Jewish run bakery, all in which I frequented during my time in the area. Both the flower market and city farm in particular 
were good places to seek out stimuli, the smell of lavender, of fresh flowers, the sights of the farm animals and cats. I was grateful to still be able to seek out those naturalistic spaces, especially when I was centred more closely towards the heart of the city. Compared to the rows of houses in South East London, more of these spaces were homed between a heavier mix of modernist and brutalist structures. Our flat hosted four people in a more confined space than in Avignon, so both the communal space and my bedroom had less capacity for more collaborative ventures. But the room I was in worked just fine to live in enough space to at least have my desk facing away from my bed to try not think about lying down too much during the day, more intimate than my previous room, to the point where it felt too familiar to me and a place where I felt like for a while I couldn't grow. A resonating occurrence with albums like Yoshimura's Green released in 1986 was that ambience can gradually become more alive when it becomes reminiscent of the space that they're trying to present themselves in. In the album's liner notes, Yoshimura wished to express the comfortable scenery of the natural cycle known as green, juxtaposing against the city life he led in Tokyo. I think a lot about his use of sounds that you hear as you hear and as you head further outside of the cities, like the crickets in his track, Sleep, and how it synthetically replicates them in a way that merges with the harmonies played. Travelling between small gain studios at the time, I found myself wanting to hear more of those sounds in the everyday again. And one way I tried to realise this was when I was developing the soundtrack for the game Bird Alone. George Batchelor, the game's developer, whilst discussing influences for me, introduced um, the works of another Japanese composer, Uji Sakamoto, who had a more experimental approach towards capturing sounds both within and outside urban landscapes. Walker, a piece from his 2017 album Async, included field recordings of his footsteps whilst walking in a leaf-filled forest layered over a bed of tonal reverberations. A combination of this listening, plus early inspiration taking from designing sounds creatively during my masters, led me to take recordings of locations and room ambiences and other similar places, then processing them through reverb plugins and effects to make something new out of them. Though it would be nice to explore more analog options in future, Logic Pro's default Reaver plugin had various tonal options where it can bring out musical tones out of the ambiences. With combinations of pitch shifting and harmonising, you can really stretch out its capacities. This ended up becoming part of the basis behind developing the ambiences for Bird Alone. We wanted to give the perspective of the bird being alone in their own world. I took the soundscapes from what would typically be the natural habitat of the bird, a rainforest in this case, and reduce them down to poor stretch like birds, beds of sounds. You might occasionally hear echoes of rainwater and animals still, but I like to think that it makes the space you share with a bird more dreamlike. Working with the soundscape for bird alone this way felt welcoming compared to everything else that was going on and due to the more ad hoc free approach that I took towards this, that was reflected a lot more through what I created for the game. For example, how I felt over the rare times I headed outside of my flat for solace, dipped into what I wrote for the game. This was especially apparent when watching animal behaviours through city farm visits, um, going to the Barbican and being in awe of the greenery, as well as like the amount of cuttings and leaves dropped to sneak out of your pockets. Or simply admiring the flowers that I get for the market to surround and brighten the inside of my flat and my bedroom. I think about the busy feeling of where I was and how I felt like I wanted to completely contrast everything I heard by making something completely peaceful. Part of creating for Bed Alone included building up a musical garden 
and as a result working with more musical and playful sound design. I was able to execute the peacefulness I felt from exploring by developing tonal palettes akin to what could be heard in Yoshimo's green, having the monstera plant represented in low reverberated tones, for example, compared to a more delicate acoustic piano for a bunch of roses. Having been inspired and been introduced to the works of Yoshimura much earlier, I was directly influenced by his work even further when conceptualising music for a later vignette in No Longer Home. I wanted to arrange an extended piece that would let each instrumental layer overlap as dialogue between the characters Bo and Al progress and let those layers build up in a way that even when at their fullest still evoke a sense of both the feelings of struggling with the impending change and um, included the eventual move away from home. I listened more extensively to Yoshimura's album Music for Nine Postcards, where in the liner notes, he had asked himself, how would this album sound if it were played in this space? The space in question was the Hara Museum of Contemporary Art in Tokyo. Similarly to how he rooted his approach as a direct response to the museum, I found myself rooting mine as a direct response to both the quiet bedroom space in the flat no longer home is set in and the dialogue it interweaves with. Starting a both bird alone and this piece in no longer home came not long before I moved out of London. Leading up to then, I felt the weight of maintaining living in the city more heavily and as much as I loved being closer to friends and partners and it was generally easier to travel, I felt a lot more confined to the place that I was living with, living in, both physically and personally. And part of that included dealing with extremities, um, extremities of either leaving my flat for whole weekends or staying in aside from shopping. Extreme to either feeling secure in how I was able to sustain living where I was, or the opposite. Unpredictab unpredictability has never settled away with me, and it felt like it was almost easier to fall back into the earlier autopiloting to not only distract myself from external conflicts, but also the internal conflicts I had within myself along with how my mindset was shifting based on trying to accept myself on the ground up. I found myself feeling like I almost had to relearn how I approached everything from scratch. Some folks who may have worked with me might not necessarily hock onto this and be like, hey, Ellie, you seemed all right with this to me, but like masking as an autistic person, that's that kind of experience for you. Um, Part of that self-acceptance came with finding London to be more of a claustrophobic and overbearing place than it should be for me. And I found myself needing more of a respite from that. That's part of why I felt like I identified even more with the music made by artists such as um, Yoshimura and Sakamoto and, they, and how they both approached incorporating naturalistic soundscapes, both realistically and synthetically as a way to escape from the city. HX7. Staggered rocks and geology covered with moss and grass. Nearby streams and rivers run white noise. In the distance, a train runs along the route. In the distance, a train runs around the valley, the rumbling ruminating from one side over to the other. Minutes away are various sets of woods to walk to. One that's easy enough to forage some fur and holly for winter. The other houses a small group of deer that watch over you as you walk to the lonely basketball hoop. Another is a place to settle, a place to listen to the constant waters. 
a half hour walk will take you to some wild garlic and nettles to forage with some bluebells in the summer. An hour out will take you to the moors where I can feel the wind mood. I can feel the winds move differently compared to down in London. They shiver as they push you and dance with a heavy rainfall. I moved up to the north of the UK in early 2019 to a small market town at the bottom of a valley. I'd visited often in the summer and the more I stopped by, the more I felt drawn to it. As I grew more wary of the anxieties that crept back in when I travelled back down south. I also got to a point where I haven't felt a need to be based somewhere like London or other major cities to be able to fit into the niche communities they have there. And before, well, early 2020, um, there was the option to travel to other towns and cities if I'd wanted to, but now it's at least it's an option. Um, I'm happy to have found a place here with a vocal arts community with a multi with a multitude of walking routes to boot. Small boat, small birds congregate on the tree parallel to our house whilst a ginger cat from one of the next door houses keeps watch. Howls from another small elderly cat from the other house over. Two years on from moving into the house where now, and compared to the spaces that were cultivated back in London, it's been the first place I've been able to have a consistent shared workspace at home with other creatives, as well as it being separate to my sleeping space. Good creative and close company who cook for each other and tell stories and experiences, who would host visitors whenever it was possible to. It felt like a place to continue growing. Being able to hear out the sounds and ambiences that were representational of what I've been hearing in albums such as Green and Async, somewhere where I can access them with ease was more meaningful to me than I thought possible. It felt like one thing trying to create music and sounds in a place where it felt like you're clashing with more bustling environments and withdrawing your energy and resources away. But when you put yourself in a space where you can feel the temperature and the light and the colours of the nearby woods and river giving you more rather than taking. A selection of the ambient music I've mentioned, along with other pieces from Western composers, made it into a playlist I curated as I formally started work on both the soundtrack and sounds for A Monster's Expedition. Though a lot of these works have some electronic basis to them, I still found myself drawn back to how acoustic pieces gather together a sense of place. Satoshi Ashikawa, for example, composed ensemble pieces that at times were only arranged for a harp, piano and a vibraphone in his 1982 album, Still Way. To me, it evoked feelings of the peace and contentment I would sometimes feel if I was sitting on a nearby bench next to one of my local streams. Having been ad hoc on the game since late 2017, I started working more consistently on it halfway through my first year in Yorkshire in which I was given more of an entry towards reworking some of the more acoustic and practical parts of my workflow. This included being able to record with more analog instruments and effects. Since moving, I felt like I've been able to work from home more here compared to say at Trove's house. It's been easier to control my surroundings the space I shared when working is mutual, as we usually keep to ourselves. And whilst I was slower to adapt to this, it's been a good alternative to be in a workspace by myself or in a typical office or studio setting. A good communal in between and what will eventually become the environment I found myself being influenced by for the first time in a while. The space I've been given to incorporate guitar work comfortably again was a major difference. There had been times where I would be so heavily fo focused on a more electronic workflow that I would be on autopilot for a lot of it. And that can be OK. Sometimes you need to do that to cope with some changes and predictability. 
at the bare minimum. However, I've been able to record and have become more confident with acoustic and microphone based recordings, which for a long while was always a low point of confidence because of the limitations I initially had. Some of that was constrained by what I had at the time, but mostly to do with place and my mindset in connection with that. And whilst I had been able to record some work in London, I found that the motivation to record more has caught up more naturally to me and that I can now give myself more of an option here. That being said, a big relocation from one end of the country to another would still be a major point of change and readjustment to make. And due to how I process this kind of change, it mostly took more until closer to the end of production on A Monster's Expedition, where I was gradually able to figure out what kind of template I wanted to work through for its soundtrack. Initially, I was hoping to record a variety of dynamic audio tracks including an acoustic, mandolin and banjo to represent certain areas of the game. The tracks will gradually become more electronic and textural in nature as you progress. While some of this concept was developed further for the game's more establishing themes, I found that I was overworking myself a little more than expected due to the anticipation of um, having this newfound energy and this um, newfound space, as well as personally being a little over ambitious led to me needing to give myself longer periods of recovery later on. I was able to think more about giving compositional, compositional space towards no longer home again. For the first time in a while, I was able to work on the game on a more consistent basis. That too included some further acoustic and analog workings, which I thought more about when I approached composing for the liminal spaces when walking around the flat. Near to the beginning of the game, you hear a quiet electric guitar sing to itself as you wander between rooms and get to know those spaces. Music interludes within smaller rooms and corridors play back more repetitively, drawing out for longer and bigger spaces like the garden. You can also interact with objects, triggering sounds that blend into the environment of the music. This way I felt more able to directly respond in a similar way to um, Yoshimura earlier to what would the music sound like if it was playing in each of those spaces. Partway through the game, you will get to hear a small handful of pieces that were less influenced by the artists I've mentioned about today and more from solo or small indie acoustic bands. One piece in particular heard whilst um, a group of friends are having a barbecue is a change for the more meticulous synthetic sounds I've written. And it makes me wonder whether it would have been something I could have written as well and more authentically compared to when I was living back in London. Even after a few year of us yearned to move away from the city beforehand, so I'm going to be concluding my time working on No Longer Home soon. I found myself relating to it again after five years, adjusting to the changes of moving away from home once more. Though this time around I was able to have more control over the independence I seeked and with that came, although slowly as I settled in, self-advocating for myself. Part of self-advocating also meant further accepting the changes that I went through over the last few years. It still took me a while to accept how those changes could still come through my work in one way or another due to how I was processing everything. And that's OK. Um, it was important to me to accept help and not just on a mental peer to peer level. This can be in the form of vocalising any adjustments or accommodations needed to feel like I want to keep going with what I'm working on. I went for a long time as an autistic person thinking that it would be more fair that I was treated the same as everyone else exactly, but that's not exactly how it works really. Um, having the extra space and time and 
energy that I have here compared to before um, allowed me to reflect exactly on my needs and wants when wanting to work with like-minded people, whether that meant having someone on the team, not necessarily a lead to check in with more often or closed captioning during calls and so on. Feeling more confident to head outside has made a major difference towards how I worked and how I approached not working. It's been much easier for me to be able to take a break between everything by going off into the woods and letting the sounds of the stream flow through my head enough to give it the hard reset it deserves. The more immediate access compared to the longer journeys that it would take to go over to Upping Forest, which I still miss from living in London, has made the local forests and cliffs more of a lifeline. It also feels more encouraging to get more inspiration from what you hear around you, especially when there may be clearer distinctions between sounds compared to what you might hear in a city setting. Ashikara mentioned in his liner notes for Stillway how certain areas and spaces are well accommodated for visualising, but sounds can at times be ignored. He wrote how he felt it was necessary to treat sound and music with the same level of daily need as we treat architecture, interior design, food or the air that we breathe. I resonate with this need of the, so of the sounds that might otherwise be ignored in busier environments, especially within the greener spaces back in London. I was grateful for the, for the amount of access towards this in both um, South and East London and though the latter I had to travel further out for compared to before. Here at least I don't have to take up too much time since I am surrounded more by the greenery I wish to take up space in. It gave me the space I need needed between everything else going on. Um, it feels like an obvious stance that like a change of scenery would help boost creativity or your well-being and I'm not going to lie about that no the major differences I've noticed in my workflow since moving. Um, some may also think that it doesn't really matter what city or place you have to be in to get the work or you can work anywhere and I technically can I have, have that privilege. Um, but it's worth taking notes about what environments you thrive in and don't and what resonates with you when you think about how you go through your experiences in those spaces. That being said, I would still visit and stay in London again if and when I get the means to and and it's worthwhile to get a break from the places you usually thrive in and think about how the places you were previously in resonate with you now compared to then. Having also mentioned about the recovery time needed from earlier, um, a big difference between doing so here compared to being in London is that I felt like I was able to execute not only more regular breaks where I would take myself outside, but also periods of not working for more than a week. Having felt the pressure whilst living in London to spend my working days, I was able to save up enough to take some time off. It's a privilege to be able to save, but as someone who needs further recovery between work than the average person, I found it essential to let myself do nothing or at least make simple preparations for the next stream or the next thing for about a month or so. Thanks to this, I was able to return to and start on work where I've been able to give more equal energy and time between each other. Where you surround yourself and how you're going through things can and will drive how you approach doing creative work and that's okay. It may be an entirely different way to do so for whoever may be watching compared to what I spoke about today. I'm glad I'm at least now at a point where I don't have to worry about changing places and spaces, at least not immediately, and can now think about what days of the week I can work on one thing or the other, and being able to approach what I do based on the accommodations I've made for myself. 
and I'm relieved that this time I could bring in the feelings, the space I had to make more environmental music akin to the ambient musicians I've mentioned into city areas or busier spaces where I imagine folks might be listening to my music, um, but without necessarily having to be in those spaces as much as before. I'm especially glad that I found myself in a place where I can keep growing. Awesome. And that was me. Thank you so much <laughs> for listening. Um, the resources there are available to check out on the transcription and slides that I'll be sharing soon on my website and on Twitter, probably a day or so after this. So watch out for those if you are following me. Awesome. Ellie, uh, we will make sure to share your website and in, um, in the, Q, uh, the link to your website in the Q&A box. Um, and again, thank you so much for sharing um, for sharing with us like all that has been affecting you both personally and professionally. Yeah, um, I believe I mean, I think that we can like all learn so much from from your experience and just to <laughs> to learn how to let ourselves be in touch with, uh, with with ourselves, actually, you know, like with with our with our needs and with with our, with our desires and actually accepting accepting what we what we actually need to uh, to, to thrive or just to or just to be well. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. No, no worries. <laughs> cool. So, um, yeah, let's let's start with um, with some of the questions that um, th that we have. So, um, you are working on video games, on animated works, and also you do you uh, and also you have your personal music project. So, how is your creative workflow different when composing for games? instead of personal music projects. It's funny you mentioned that because I haven't actually got, this is going to sound very sad, I don't have a lot of personal music projects to fall back to, um, mostly because like I haven't had as much time as I wanted to still, like I'm very grateful that I'm able to kind of be insecure in that. Um, it's funny, I saw a very recent tweet about how there's kind of a feeling of somebody saying like, hey, you should be doing a little bit of what you do or your craft every day or do a little side thing for fun. And like, and honestly, like I just haven't been able like, to do that. I haven't been able to do that as much and I resonate with that. So, and if anything, I'd rather spend most of my time kind of like resting between everything. So. Um, so I don't have too much to compare to right now, but I've noted that when I do um, any sort of kind of side projects or anything like collaboration makes a bit, big difference. Um, like, for example, I do have like a side for fun kind of music EP that I have kind of been doing with my partner sometimes. And one of my peers and I were also talking about um, potentially sharing a Ableton project together to just um, dip into sometimes and collaborate onto it every now and then. Um, it definitely helps to have that kind of drive and motivation behind it and having like somebody kind of supporting you through that if you wanted to. Um, and I found a part of my workflow generally when doing things for games or my work, I find one of the most fun elements of it is the more collaborative kind of brainstorming aspects of it. Um, so in short, like it's not at least like too much difference between mm -hmm. doing things and games like I'm usually like if I was doing things on my own, I might be a little bit more lax about it and maybe a bit more experimental as well. Like the smaller, smaller things I've done outside of um, collaborations has been like a lot of kind of small audio visual things at the moment. And that's been a neat thing to kind of have a break away from staring at more technical kind of audio sort of <laughs> stations. And um, you, as we mentioned, so you've composed for installation, performance and film works in the past, in addition to all the great work that, you, <laughs> that you've done. Uh, so how different do you find designing uh, for interactive media? 
I'm going to be also be a little boring and the short answer is like at least from my experience there's not too much like I still feel like I'm kind of new-ish to everything in the fact that like I everything feels quite similar to my approach um at least like comparing to say like short film work that I've done um when I've approached composing the music and if I'm working on some narrative games for example sections of that come with a mixture of um linear and non-linear options for developing audio um, either way, I would still sometimes work through things to sync against footage of game audio, um, especially when I want to like turn around work a bit quicker. Um, and then installation and performance, on the other hand, are both a little more different since they do have some degree of independent working or more like collaborative, um, more practical collaborative kind of work. Um, they can be just more of that if you want them to be. It depends on what you're really doing with each of them. Um, I think all of them have a common thread in establishing like thematic elements and textures and other musical kind of motifs that keep familiar familiarity throughout each thing, depending on whether you're creating a performance or installation that's driven by music and driven by sound. I think sounds has a lot more potential to kind of just be a bit more out there and experimental. And I think that's probably like the major difference where you can like tap into sort of stuff that you wouldn't usually do outside of the usual systems that you're working in. Um, when working on games, at what point do you prefer to join the process? Like, is it during the, the concept and visual <laughs> development phase or when the game is fully fleshed out? And actually, how does this affect, uh, how do these stages like affect your creative process? Uh, that's a good question. Like, and I feel like if you're asking for my preference, like it's straight up concepts and visual development. Now it really depends on like the definition of like how the game is fully freshed out because if we're talking like a handful of months before shipping then mm, <laughs> um, maybe that could be a bit more difficult but um, yeah like I definitely have felt like not only inspired by the things I've talked about but like I I'm very like visually orientated when looking at um, various concepts and if you have like a demo of the game as well then that's obviously absolutely fine um, and it's also easier I found because like I'm luckily like at a point where folks have approached me um, with mostly like kind of concepts and a small kind of like pitch deck and I think like having things more conceptualized make it easier to pitch to the um not only pitch to the audio and music person but also like allow them the earlier kind of space to um kind of like be involved in the process much earlier um like the general consensus for me is kind of the earlier the better really like i've i think i've only worked on a small handful of things that locked in the audio at more of a short term notice but i've definitely found myself being more comfortable much earlier, especially when I feel like I'm kind of part of an equal when it comes to being a, like a core team of folks making a thing together. Since, since your work is in, 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 um, it's like super important, uh, about, uh, integral, inter, in, oh, geez, sorry, what, what has been like <laughs> happening with my pronunciation? Okay, this is, this it is, happens to the best of us. Yeah, let's, yeah, we'll say yeah, this is like so a technical funny. issue, yeah. Uh, Jeez, I cannot pronounce it again. Like, so your work is very important, like, and um, like essential to how uh, these um, playful worlds are uh, in games are created. So, uh, how do you see uh, a difference between soundtrack and audio design? Oh, so basically, um, I have always kind of generally approached audio design more creatively and less technically compared to probably most other audio folks I know when it comes to sounds. So because of that, there hasn't been too much difference in that regard, maybe aside from how I was taught 
um, both um, music and sound based things because whilst I was lucky to have like a mix of like education and experience when it comes to making music, sound design was a lot more self-taught as I understood how most indie folks I knew would try to pick up more than kind of one thing at a time to get by. So I could feel that things were being a bit kind of rough around the edges as I was doing a lot more foley and kind of figuring out things, especially when I haven't been like technically trained as hard. Um, I currently like find the difference, at least like whilst I'm working on soundtracks more independently these days, I currently find audio design to be a lot more collaborative as I work closely alongside whoever's um, programming with me on the a game that I'll be on to um, kind of shape the audio system together. Um, like an earlier, like it's nice to just kind of bounce off between people sometimes. Um, and whilst I'm happy to be working on both music and sound things still, um, I'm excited for any opportunity to potentially collaborate with a sound designer whilst I focus on music and as a result kind of like creating something together based on that kind of setup. Awesome. Ali, I think it's important uh, that I share that we have um, we have um, comments from the audience uh, saying how they have uh, enjoyed your talk a lot. Oh. Um, <laughs> Yeah, because I'm not sure that you will see see them, but yeah, like uh, we have like a couple of of announcement, like saying uh, how uh, how this is a very very nice nice talk and a lot of a lot of nice content, and also <laughs> um, we have a very interesting question, like um, oh from the or a suggestion, yeah, uh, somebody's asking like, have you ever made a game that is like this talk? I would love to play through a narrative exploration of the places you've lived. Oh, what do you think of that idea? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sign me up. <laughs> um, I mean, it's funny because like when I was um, just like brainstorming for this talk, like I had considered like um, because like this, this close kind of small games experiences I've kind of built for myself was um, through Bitsy. Um, and I've kind of only made, I think, one small game as like a um, gift from a partner. <laughs> but um, I do would like to kind of experiment with more kind of smaller game tools and experiment with like um, how I can like implement audio and different sound things to just make something different from them. Um, but the point is that um, I had heard about like a 3D mod of um, Bitsy, like a, Bits, a Bitsy 3D hack, which looked fantastic to um, like um, see like how the buildings look. Um, I can't remember sadly the name of the game, but I know that um, someone I know, um, Cecile Richard, um, had recently made a Bitsy game using that hack and the spaces that they've built um, as a result, um, look especially good. Um, if I can find um, the tweet later, then I'm, I'll probably share it on my Twitter or retweet um, so people can check it out. Um, but I wanted to like, I considered building each of the places that I lived in as like a small bit of like extra interaction with kind of the talk. So yeah, I wouldn't rule out doing anything like that sometime. Like, I definitely have found a heavy significance to the places that I've lived in in the past. And, like, the closest I can, like, suggest in terms of, like, if you want to explore, not necessarily, like, my spaces, it won't be, like, my experiences, but it'll be the experiences of my close peers. Um, the closest that you might experience exploring spaces is when um, the game that I've mentioned about No Longer Home releases later this year. Feels like cheeky to do a such shameless <laughs> plug, but um, but I think like that has, as I've mentioned, like it's been a really kind of nice space to be able to develop um, the sounds for as you explore through their flat and seeing how um, their like Humble Groves experiences come through through that. Um, so that would be, I think, the closest kind of experience Buzz for me exploring my flats, my places. We shall see. 
we shall see. Uh, <laughs> yeah, do you have like any favorite ambient game soundtracks that you'd like to share with us? Ooh. Well, it's it's funny, like, um, I'm kind of like in the middle of like curating a playlist for um, a radio at the moment and like um, the top ones, if you're speaking like specifically ambient game soundtracks, the two um, that instantly come up for me is, I'm going to be a very obvious indie kid here, but um, the Kentucky Route Zero soundtrack um, has been one kind of solid kind of inspiration just because it was it's been nice to just hear those sounds of like not only just like the symphonic sort of sounds developed but just like feeling the rumbles and how that kind of merged into the environments in that game had and like it's definitely like i think i think chapter three i still need to play play for it all but um part three <clears throat> sorry um is especially um significant to how I've checked out um, that soundtrack. Another soundtrack that I really like is um, made by my friend um, Jocelyn Braze and she composed for the soundtrack. She composed the soundtrack for Overland, um, which is a kind of post-apocalyptic kind of game where you kind of go through and pick up buddies or not buddies and dogs and try and get from one side of the map to another and it's like she's just really good at like combining like the use of like synthetic like haunted sort of sounds with like these raw um these raw kind of like drum sounds because i think she's a drummer as well like it's really cool to hear how she kind of incorporated her more kind of practical instrumentation stuff with what she composed as well so I'll say those are like a few of the top two. Like I could think of, I could probably think of a few more if you gave me time. But like, um, I think the top two, top two are are enough at this moment. Like, maybe, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, maybe like we can open a Twitter discussion later and have a a thread of like favorite. Oh sure, yeah, like yeah. soundtracks. <laughs> but like two are enough for this um, for this <laughs> chat. Uh, so Ellie, finally. Um, sure. For the end of of of, of our session, um, can you share with us like what do you look for in a dream collaborator or studio? Sure. Like I feel like it's like almost a standard question about like who's your dream dream IP like <laughs> and all that fun stuff. But I don't really have any as per se because I've been really lucky that um, a lot of the folks I've worked with have already been the kind of collaborations I've wanted to do and that's been pretty fulfilling I think um, so what I look for when collaborating with us like I've mentioned earlier in the talk about how for me being able to vocalize more comfortably to have like the accommodations that I'd like um, like it's still quite a recent thing for me to keep doing that since I felt like for a while I've had to tread careful like footing with disclosing about my disability like this is before game stuff like as a transparency like this is more for office and studio based jobs which is like entirely kind of different ballpark I think um, but I've been really lucky to have found more kind of like-minded folks through voicing these accommodations so I'm personally like as a personal thing to work through I'm trying to get braver about voicing them and narrowing down folks I wanted to work with based on that um because if they can't fit like what my needs are when working then no <laughs> um like other than that um like outside of just like accommodations and things like i like to work with people who um tell stories about their experiences through what they make or they're helping like the right folks tell their stories um so as a transparency for like what i'm working on at the moment i'm still on no longer home but wrapping on it very soon and more recently um surf, surf club with um melbourne based olivia haynes um they're both narrative adventure like stories and as i've mentioned earlier it's been like elevating to be able to have like some experiences shared to help kind of tear the tell those stories and inform um what you do as a result of that um 
and outside of more narrative things like I love any kind of opportunity to work on like interactive and kind of playful experiences in a way that would complement what I make or what I want to do really well uh, like bird alone I'd say would be like up there as one of the closest things as well um, and more broadly um, I have various like kind of like long shot shots a long shot amount of things I'd like to do just in the future um, like music for animated TV more as an example like since animation has been another strong point of inspiration because I've like a lot of the short films I've done are short animations um, or more location going back to more location installation or interdisciplinary kind of base work since I've really kind of missed doing more of that sort of thing over that masters like it's one of those things I always tell myself like I would like to give myself more space to be commissioned to those sorts of things but you know one day we'll figure it out we'll figure it out yeah um Ellie again thank you so much on behalf of the British Council crew and on behalf of our audience for such a such a warm and personal personal <laughs> talk. We really appreciate it. And um, yeah, we're looking forward to to hearing like all the great stuff that you're going to do in the future. We have shared um, we have shared a link to your um, Twitter and a link to your website in the chat. So everyone, please make sure to follow Ali and to stay in touch with their work. Uh, it was a pleasure having you here. We really yeah, hope that you, you enjoyed it as me. well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you again for like for inviting me and also thank you everyone for supporting me. This was my first talk, so Yay. that's a tick off. <laughs> awesome. Um, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Thank, thank you, you so again. much. Your, yeah, your talk will be available soon on uh, the British Council's uh, website and YouTube channel. So everyone will be able to uh, to enjoy like this narrative adventure, this walkthrough through all the places that, <laughs> that you live. <laughs> Thanks again. Sounds okay. good. Uh, yeah, sounds great. OK, so uh, this was our ninth salon and our last salon in this series will be held on 10th of March and we will be talking about designing good UI UX. Our speaker will be Anissa Sanusi. She is a senior UI designer at Roll7 and founder of Limit Break, a mentorship program for underrepresented genders in the UK games industry. Uh, she has worked on multiple titles across like PC, console and mobile platforms and um, you should definitely join us on the 10th of March um, as uh, Anissa will highlight some key UI UX tips and tricks. Also, on the afternoon on, of 24th of March, we will be hosting the last event in the Play UK 2021 program. Uh, this will be a live showcase event brought to you live from a brand Play UK virtual exhibition space. We will be announcing more details about the event next week and how you can visit the exhibition space on the British Council website. So keep a look out. Uh, thank you all again for being with us and see you in two weeks. Take care. Bye.